subscribe tag tv youtube channel and press the notification button people have to live in in unity we are still in transition civil society has been decimated of course we rely on media and i think the government has not done enough the international community has failed to respond no place in the world is perfect the yoga event is held here severe injustice and they should be stopped we should raise our voices condemn this uh, brutal act I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. As the United Kingdom and Russia have announced the beginning of vaccination from next week, India is expected to make a similar announcement soon. While it is associated with multiple vaccine developers, there are a few including Russia Sputnik that are at the final stage. The government meanwhile has announced that it doesn't plan to vaccinate the entire country as of now and will regulate its strategies as per the need and also the efficacy of the vaccine. Indian pharma company Dr Reddy's and Russian direct investment fund has started clinical trials for Sputnik V COVID-19 vaccine in India. They say they have launched adaptive phase 2 and 3 clinical trials after receiving the necessary clearance from the Indian authorities. The two companies are in agreement to produce and distribute 400 million doses in the country. Meanwhile, Serum Institute of India, which has partnered with AstraZeneca to manufacture its COVID-19 vaccine, will continue to test a two full dose regimen of the shot. in case of covax vaccine all over the world mostly most of the regulators have accepted that if the efficacy is shown more than 50% they will prefer to start using that vaccine on a mass scale so anything which is beyond 50% is always going to be a plus plus The British drug maker has said its COVID-19 vaccine could be up to 90% effective if administered as a half dose followed by a full dose. Serum Institute, which is currently running trials in India testing the safety of AstraZeneca's vaccine as well as the immune response it triggers, has no plans currently to alter them to include the half dose full dose regimen. to take into account what is the price what is the economy what is the ease of transportation and what is the ease of storage because some of the vaccines which all we know requires minus 70 minus 80 degrees uh, storage conditions some requires minus 20 degrees storage conditions some requires to be transported with the dry ice there is a restriction of using dry ice and the quantity of dry ice in the uh, aircrafts the global trials showed the efficacy rate of the shot was 62% if the full dose was given twice as it was for the most study participants in trials in britain and brazil Meanwhile the government of India has said it will vaccinate only the required number of people and not the entire country. Our purpose is to break the virus chain of virus transmission. So if we are able to vaccinate a critical mass of people and break that virus transmission then we may not have to vaccinate the entire population. The government of India has been keeping a consistent check on the progress made by various firms towards vaccine development. 
Prime Minister Narendra Modi took a vaccine tour to different parts of the country to take real stock of the situation. The country has successfully contained the sudden surge in the number of cases but requires a long-lasting solution to return entirely back on the track. Most of the authorities in the country have said the country will have the vaccine by January-March window. While countries around the world have systematically got away with the term lockdown, the situation is remarkably different in the illegally occupied POK, the region under Pakistan's control. After failing to prepare itself to fight the deadly COVID even after months of its outbreak, the administration in the region is still resorting to lockdowns and other strict restrictions, causing massive inconvenience and losses to locals. Recently, a large number of them took to streets and demonstrated against the government. They said the government's actions were a mere knee-jerk reaction to avoid international criticism and embarrassment. Small traders and shopkeepers in the illegally occupied POK took to streets after they were told that the government might just extend the 15-day lockdown by another fortnight. They have called it a knee-jerk reaction of the government to conceal its incompetence amidst rising COVID cases and a simultaneous international pressure. They say such calls do not address the problems they face during the shutdown of services. While some of them have already been flouting the norms, citing the decision as arbitrary and apathetic, others have vowed to disregard it in coming days. They say the government has been absolutely negligent during pandemic and has done only what is indispensable. The lockdown decision is part of that model only. ये जो लॉकडाउन है ये सारा ताजुबादी के साथ बहुत बड़ा जुल्म है इससे पहले भी जो ये सात आठ महीने का जो कारोबार है इसमें जो छोटा कारोबारी है वो तो पहले से खत्म हो गया है हम इससे ये गवर्नमेंट से ये अपील करते हैं कि होना चाहिए या नहीं होना चाहिए लॉकडाउन नहीं होना चाहिए नहीं होना चाहिए एसओपीज के मुताबिक अगर लॉकडाउन करना है इंतहाई जरूरी हो गया तो फिर गवर्नमेंट को चाहिए कि वो ये दुकानों के किराए बिजली के बिल और दुकानदार के जो छोटा दुकानदार है उसके लिए वो सोचते हैं मैया करें The traders in this illegally occupied region are among those who have been affected most due to the pandemic. The chilly winters before the outbreak of the pandemic had already hit their employment. Severe government measures, which have otherwise proven to be counterproductive, further hampered their businesses. Anything beyond this, they say, will push them towards destitution. हम लॉकडाउन की आमायत नहीं करते, हम अपने बेटों की, अपने चुनों की, अपनी पेट की आमायत करते हैं। इस लॉकडाउन से हमारे फाका कशी पे लोग मजबूर होंगे। गजाश्ता एक साल से कारोबारी जो अजराते हैं, ताजर जो अजराते हैं, मसालसल क्रेडिट पे सफर कर रहे हैं, मार्किट के कर्जदार हैं, मजीद ताजर के बस में नहीं हैं। शाह जलवाल ने दुकानें बंद करेंगे या खोलेंगे? हम नहीं, हम दुकानें खोलेंगे इन्शाअल्लाह अल्लाह ने जा। More than 12,000 people have contracted the deadly virus in the ill-equipped Pakistan-occupied Kashmir, but the residents say. The local administration, which operates strictly under the commands of Islamabad, never responded with the alacrity disease demanded. While other countries across the world prepared themselves in the first few weeks of the outbreak, the administration in the illegally occupied POK didn't do anything to improve its medical infrastructure and preparedness during lockdown.
this is the reason locals say the government is forced to announce lockdowns which do not gain anything substantive in fighting against the virus. Moving on. Afghan women are amongst the most suppressed and backward thanks to the Taliban which pushed a primitive anti-women atmosphere in the country that continues to prevail even today nearly two decades after its ouster. However, there are a few who have defied the conservative norms of society and have gone on to become inspiration for others. Let's have a look at one such story which not only comprises grit and passion but an unparalleled courage in the face of the resurging footprints of Taliban. Soraya Shahidi is the first female tattoo artist in Afghanistan. She is one of those women in the war-torn country who have defied all social restrictions to pursue their interest. Many in Afghanistan consider ink on the skin a sin in Islam, but this couldn't dampen the spirit of Shahidi. Shahidi acquired her skills while living as a refugee in Iran and Turkey and decided to return to Kabul to fill the void. She says fundamentalists in the country have been misleading the youth of the country for a long time and she won't give in to the pressure. تو حرام نیست ولی یگان مولاها هستن که مثلا تتو رو میگن حرام ولی یگان مولاهایی هم هستن که میگن تتو حرام نیست و کسایی هم بوده که با من گفتن که مثلا تتو حرام است تو کار حرام انجام میدی اما نه به نظر من تتو حرام نیست یک شوق و علاقه است و من انجام میدم شاهدی بیلیوز اینترست ان تاتوز از گروئینگ امانگ یانگ پیپل ان دی کانتری Apart from tattooing, Shahidi also provides eyelash extension and manicure services, all of which were banned during the Taliban's tough rule of the country between 1996 and 2001. The Taliban has now struck a deal with the Afghan government where two sides are ready to talk on the prominent issues of ceasefire and role of women in society building. The hardline Islamists say that they are ready to mend their ways. Millions of women, including Shahidi, are optimistic of having an improved atmosphere for women in the country if the Taliban gets a role in the government. من فکر می کنم که طالبان او طالبان قدیم نیست و غیر از ما خانوما اگر او طالب طالب قدیم باشه غیر از ما خانوما مرد ها هم برشان جای تشویش ایجاد میشه و من فکر می کنم که طالب او طالب قدیم نیست و ما خانوم ها هم او خانوم های قدیم نیستیم که این دست آورد هایی را که در این چند سال به دست آوردیم بتانیم به راحتی از دست بدیم و بر ما آمدن یا نیامدن طالب مهم نیست بر ما صلح و آرامش در کشور ما مهم است Afghan women have proven it on more than one occasion that are ready and deserve to be treated at par with the men in the society The government measures in the past few years have given them a push and they are at a relatively better position with many of them participating in fields that were deemed a prerogative of men. Women who have equal rights in the country's constitution now make up 28% of the Afghan legislative body higher than the global average. Afghan public approval of a woman's right to vote is at a record high of 89.3%. The observers, however, say that this is not the true picture of the situation of women in Afghanistan. The government policies and laws have allowed them a significant representation in some sectors, but a majority of them are deprived of even fundamentals in the country.
Several global reports say that Afghanistan is still amongst the most unsafe places for women on earth. Two-thirds of girls in the country still have not received any formal education. More than three-fourths of the women face forced marriage in the country. Experts say that in order to be truly sustainable, peace must be inclusive, broad-based and reflective of the needs and aspirations of all of society. Therefore, women need unambiguous constitutional protections of their rights to avoid regression. Moving on. Amid a widening internal rift in the power corridors of Kathmandu, the international diplomacy of the country is making some real headways. Sustained diplomatic engagement with its perennial partner India has yielded breakthroughs and both the countries have now committed to revitalize their relationship with even more vigor and positivity. The political experts, however, say that these developments have irked China a neighbour of both which has been trying to build inroads in Nepal and is seeking to control country's decision-making body. Chinese Defence Ministerial visit at a time when New Delhi and Kathmandu have seemed to resort their diplomatic and cartographic impasse is being seen as another attempt to disrupt the process. Today, we have with us Biswas Baral, a senior journalist and a geopolitical expert who has been closely following the developments. So, Mr. Baral, how do you analyze the Indo-Nepal relationship in its present form, especially after a ramped up diplomatic engagement from both sides to revive the ties that had suffered a few roadblocks? I think uh, both the governments uh, are in a mood to, to improve bilateral ties. And recently, even the Indian External Affairs Minister, S. Jayashankar, said that uh, the, the relationships are on a mend. Uh, and uh, so I think uh, there is willingness on both, both the sides that, that uh, such an important relation as India and Nepal cannot be allowed to deteriorate. So that is one thing. Another thing is there is also a lot of political calculations involved. I think uh, having having been, been a little disillusioned, I would say, by, um, by the Chinese. Uh, now KPO is seeking Indian help uh, again. Uh, so I think both these factors are at play. There are many political observers who believe that China is irked by these developments. How much do you agree with the accusation that Beijing is trying to influence decision-making body of Nepal against India? Um, if you see, in the last few years, uh, particularly since the formation of this government in 2017, the Chinese have been more and more active uh, in Nepal. And uh, unlike the past, their activism, their intervention, in a way, uh, in government affairs has also increased, and which is also the, directly the result of, of the ruling Nepal Communist Party wanting to establish a close relations uh, with China, largely to balance India's influence, particularly after the blockade. So I think there is some truth to the fact that the Chinese are more active in Nepal. And I think if, even if you look at the larger picture in South Asia, I think China has decided that the days when it gave the Indians the benefit of doubt, uh, in the sense that uh, the Indians would not harm Chinese interests, or the Indians would not uh, ally closely with the Americans. Uh, that has proved uh, to be not true. So I think the Chinese are in a mood uh, to actively counter the, uh, the Indian influence in Nepal. So, uh, so it's a result of this uh, old geopolitical tussle. I think uh, so this is a new chapter, I guess. Do you think a strong India-Nepal relationship poses a challenge to China's ambitious Belt and Road Initiative? I don't think so because uh, Nepal and India are linked uh, the, the, by geography. Uh, the, the reason they have such close ties, among uh, many other reasons, is the, their close geography. Um, and, uh, and they are culturally similar. There are other ties too. And, uh, 
I think uh, that if the, the Indians uh, get the more, the Indians get closer to the Americans. Now the Indians have a strategic partnership of shots with the Americans. So uh, the closer the Indians get to the Americans, I think the more the Chinese will be concerned. So the more the Chinese will look to uh, oppose the Indian actions, or the more the Chinese will feel compelled to act to secure their, their interests in Nepal. Because I think the Chinese now feel that uh, the Americans are using the Indians to, to, to try to contain it in South Asia, uh, in other parts of the world as well, but especially in South Asia. And I think China has decided that in, it needs to more actively, uh, it needs to be more actively involved to protect its interests in South Asia, and I think the same calculus applies in case of Nepal as well. Festivals are the essence of India's cultural landscape, and they have been instrumental in sustaining and perpetuating the story of Indian heritage. While some of them are celebrated to mark the periodic happiness of harvesting, others have been educating people of their history and culture. Dev Dipavali, which literally translates to Dipavali or the Valley of Gods, is one such festival that gives an insight into the Hindu mythology and is celebrated with huge pomp and gaiety in the country. Have a look. India's religious capital Varanasi glittered with more than a million earthen lamps and lights as devotees celebrated Dev Dipavali one of the deeply revered festivals that falls after a fortnight of Diwali, the festival of lights. Prime Minister Narendra Modi led the celebrations with prayers and cherished elaborated cultural programs from a cruise boat in River Ganges, on whose bank the temple town is situated. As per mythology, the day marks the victory of Hindu lord of destruction Shiva over the demon Tripurasur. Essentially, it is the victory of good over evil. Devout Hindus believe that deities descend the planet Earth on this day of calendar every year to celebrate the victory. आज माँ गंगा के सानिध्य में काशी प्रकाश का उत्सव मना रही है और मुझे भी महादेव के आशीर्वाद से इस प्रकाश गंगा में डुबकी लगाने का सौभाग्य मिल रहा है A grand laser light show was the highlight of the evening. The festival is a major tourist attraction and the scene of a million lamps lighting the ghats and river in vivid colours has often been described by visitors and tourists as a breathtaking sight. Priests offering prayers holding huge butter lamps is another tourist attraction that thousands gather to witness every year. Today, Kasi was like that the gods have come to Kasi and are making Diwali. And the answer to that is our Yashasvi Pradhan Mantri. नरेंद्र मोदी जी बने आज जैसी देव दिवाली मन रही है ऐसा लगता है कि सच में गंगा का बेटा गंगा से अपना किया हुआ वादा पूरा कर रहा है ऑन दी ओकेशन डेविटीज ऑल्सो टूक अ होली टिप इन दी कैंचेस ऑफर्ड स्पेशल प्रेयर्स दिस इज इंडिस्पेंसेबल टू ऑलमोस्ट ऑल इंडियन फेस्टिवल्स Devotees say that taking bath in river absolves them of all the wrongs they have done in their lives. The ritual also has a scientific base to it as submergence in water reduces pain and inflammation 
and also calms the nervous system, reducing the levels of stress and anxiety in the body and improving one's mood. The Government of India has lately been emphasizing at the promotion of culture, a fundamental component of country's growing soft power. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.